Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure I welcome the king of the ukulele, Mr. Ralph Shaw. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I must say, though, I get, I get a little bit embarrassed by the king of the ukulele these days because I, I gave myself that name when uh, there were pretty well no other ukulele players around and now there's a lot of players much better than me. <laughs> well, there is only one Ralph Shaw. That's true. As I, <laughs> and I, I always think we can, all, we can all be kings and queens in our own little world, can't we? That's true. I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was life like growing up for you? Wow, that's a big question. Ukulele related, I'd have to say, I, I, the, the very first ukulele I ever held was, belonged to my grandfather. He had played one in his 20s, and the, this was just an old instrument that, that was just kicking around the house, and, and my father put real string on it, you know, like gar hairy gardening string. So uh, it was totally unplayable. So, so for me, the ukulele was a, a, a mystery object. Uh, and I grew up in a village in Yorkshire in, in England, so I, I'm not sure what, what TV shows you might have seen. There was one called All Creatures Great and Small, but it's sort of windblown moorland, you know? So it's a, it's a fairly harsh climate, probably similar to the Scottish Highlands, that kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of farm folk around there. And, uh, you know, it wasn't as a teenager, it wasn't easy to get around. At the time, it seemed quite normal, but but I realised, especially by today's standards, that I spent a lot of time doing my own thing, you know, creating my own entertainment. When I when I got gifts, you know, it was it was often like real tools for for woodworking and you know a painting. So there was always this uh, element of creation, making up your own stories and games, and, and and getting into trouble, and you know all the usual thing, you know, but and lo lots of outdoor play as well. And I guess, I think part of me actually believed the reality of, of what you'd see on, on, on television. So, so when you saw these fictional situations of, of how pop stars lived, I'm thinking now, for example, the Beatles, how they would all go in separate doors. And when they got inside the house, it was just all one room. I, I think I believed a, a lot of that kind of thing. You know, when you watched an Elvis movie where Elvis would sing and suddenly everybody would join in. I think part of me always believed that that could happen. And and I think to some extent it, it still does. And, and that's what I go out with as an entertainer. You know, I, 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 I believe that people will just join in, in with my little musical world. And, uh, and, and quite often they do, which is wonderful. Well, you mentioned the Beatles. What types of music did you grow up liking the most? Actually, funnily enough, not the Beatles. I was born in 1964. So I, I think by the time I was really listening to music, the, the Beatles were quite passe. So it w I don't remember hearing their music as a child, which surprises people. So yeah, they, they're, they're not part of my scheme at all. I, I mentioned Elvis when I was around 13 years old. I, I They showed Elvis movies through every day through the Christmas holidays. So, so it was quite neat to, to, to grow up with that as a kind of entertainment. My grandfather, on the other hand, uh, he lived just around the corner and uh, he was one that would sing songs when I was a, a child. So I, I, I grew up hearing a lot of those songs and I'm not even... I, I couldn't even name his too many titles right now. It's just that when I was very young, my mum, she... Uh, thought this kid knows a lot of songs you know I was four years old and, and she wrote down about 25 songs that, that I was singing and and I didn't even, you know they weren't kids songs right these were these are things I'd learned from my grandfather but then later on you know it, it was I'd, I would listen to what my friends listened to and, and like what what they liked so I picked things up like uh, there was Led Zeppelin for a while there was ELO there was Pink Floyd in my in my early teens I got this book called the uh, the encyclopedia of rock which for me was like the internet of the day because you could um, look up you know a band or a musician you were interested in and then it would be cross-referenced to their links to other parts of the book where other band members had been in their band or they played music with someone else so so it was from that that I then discovered my own music that my friends didn't even know about and, and it was through that that I 
that I got interested in all sorts. Frank Zappa, Little Feet, Arlo Guthrie. It was it was it just became a, a really eclectic kind of mix of, of music that I liked then. Your first album, The King of the Ukulele. The songs are all from the Tin Pan Alley. In my humble opinion, you made those songs magical. They'd been recorded so many times, but some of my favorite versions of those classics are the ones that you recorded. You did a beautiful version of Blue Skies with that long harmonica intro. I've played a lot of those songs on the air. You did a beautiful version of Putting on the Ritz. It had a few humorous songs, too. I'd never heard of Taking My Oyster for Walkies. So tell us about your love for those songs. It's, it's so wonderful to hear you say that, Paul. Let me tell, if I can, can I tell you a story of something that happened just a week ago? I, I got a phone call from a fellow in England. He, he's, a, he's an artist. And every, every two or three years, he calls me up just to tell me something. You know, and he's got this rich, plum English voice. And he, he told me about how he just received a terrific shock he thought one of his neighbors an elderly neighbor was in trouble he'd he'd, he'd, he'd pretty well gone to kick the door down you know because he thought he was in danger and then he realized he might be visiting a friend and then it turned out that he, this elderly neighbor was visiting a friend but giles he said he said he said ralph i was very much in in shock he said so i i listened to my iPod and I've got thousands of songs. You wouldn't believe how many songs I've got. And I thought, what do I really need to listen to at a time like this? And straight away, Ralph, I thought of you and King of the Ukulele. And <laughs> he said, he said, I've I've got it, it was reeling off, you know, Frank Sinatra, Joe Stafford, the Beatles, the the Stones is reeling off all these names. He said, but Ralph, it was you that I thought of, you know. <laughs> so, so that was it was so so neat. They happened for me when I started to play the ukulele because I thought I would play rock songs, but I found that a lot of uh, modern music sounded very boring when played with the ukulele, the very simple chords. And reaching into into the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, those songs I discovered are so well written, m melodically, the chords, uh, the lyrics, every, everything was so clever. And, and in fact, I, I, it was all so good that I stopped writing my own songs at that point. Uh, I thought, why write my own not, not very good stuff when there is this treasure trove of, of songs to draw from? So, yeah, I, re I recorded those and produced, I must say, by Jeff Gibbons, who did a, a great job there. I really don't know what to say why people seem to like my versions of them it's uh, I, I just sing them in the way I feel they they should be sung and uh, I do seem to have a, a sort of Tin Pan Alley vaudeville aspect to my style that, that seems to suit those songs quite well you did a second album with a lot of old songs on there you did La Mer and then there was one song that st sticks out in my mind I believe the title was I Just Wish I Was In Love Uh huh. tell us about that one well, there's there's several songs on that album that aren't all songs, but uh, they sound like they could be. So this one is one that Jeff Gibbons again, the producer, he he showed up at the door as a, you know, when I when I arrived for for the recording session, and he said, Ralph, I had a dream about you last night. He said you were in a park, you were like Gene Kelly, you were dancing and you were singing a song. He said, and I don't I don't remember the. All, all, the, all the words, but he was singing, I just wish I was in love, and I remember the tune. So he played me the tune and uh, sort of what, what lyrics he could remember, and then left it for me to write the rest of the song. So I spent the, the next day or two finishing that off. And it was, it was probably a year or two later that I, I realized that he, this song he had thought of as Gene Kelly, and Gene Kelly is famous for singing in the rain. You know, I don't care what's going on. It can pour with rain. I don't care because I'm in love, right? Well, this song is the exact opposite sentiment. This song says, everything in the world is perfect. The sun's shining. Children are playing. But what does it all matter? What does it all mean if you hmm. don't have someone to love? Just a neat reversal there. I don't want to put you on the spot here. But do you happen to have a ukulele handy? Oh, I, I do have one. I, I always have one by my desk. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if it's in tune. Oh, not too bad, yeah. Would you care to play that for all the listeners out there? Hmm, okay. Let's, uh, let's play something. I've, I've just, I've, this is just something I've been working on, so it's sort of uh, fresh in my mind.
Bring me a dream, make her the cutest that I've ever seen. Give her two lips like roses in clover. Then tell me that my lonely nights are over. Sandman, I'm so alone. Ain't got nobody to call my own. Please turn on your magic beam. Mr. Sandman, bring me Sandman. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. There you go. <laughs> thank you on behalf of all the listeners. Thank you so much. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you. Mr. Shaw, one thing that I've heard you say several times, well, I've seen you write, is respect for the ukulele. What does that mean to you? Back back when I wrote that, and I, you know, and I, I think I put that in the liner notes of, of the King of the Ukulele album, that, that was at the time when the ukulele was treated as a, as a joke, which... Uh, in a lot of ways, I didn't mind because as an entertainer, I could walk on stage with a ukulele and people would just start smiling straight away because it was something goofy and silly. But with that statement, I also wanted people to, to realize that it's a musical instrument and that it has, you know, it has so much potential. Any kind of music can be played on it just because it's small and got four strings. You know, doesn't make it silly. A violin has, is small and has four strings too. So that that's that was really my intent. It was it was before the present ukulele boom took off. It was to let people know, yeah, here's here's an instrument worthy of of being looked at, worthy of being noticed, worthy of being taken up by all kinds of musicians. And it's it's quite wonderful. This is probably now 16 or 17 years after I wrote that. I, I don't need to say it anymore. There, there are so many great players have uh, taken up the ukulele and are doing all kinds of things with it. And, and I don't think, I don't think it's ever going to fall back into that tiny Tim niche goofy status anymore. I think, I think it's um, here to stay as a, as a recognised instrument. You know, it, that happened with the saxophone. It happened with the banjo. You know, these were all new instruments at one time that that people l l saw as novelties, and uh, then they became established things. And I, I think we've hit that point now with the ukulele. You have two new albums out. Tell all the listeners about these two new records of Ralph Shaw's. Yeah, they're called Love and Laughter. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that I started writing my own songs when I discovered uh, the, the Tim Pan Alley era. Well, after a few years, I did start writing songs again. And w what those older songs did for me, really studying the, the songs of Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, Jerome Kern, all these great songwriters, it made me a much greater self-critic of, of my own work. I've learned to know when a song is not finished. I think a lot of a lot of modern songwriters, you know, write songs and the, the first thing they, they write, the first thing they put out, they, they think it's a done deal. And I, I listen to it and I go, oh, they could have done so much more with this. Made, they could have made it so much better. And so that's what I've done with, with my songwriting, which falls into two categories. I, I, have, a, I have funny songs and I, I, I write songs on the theme of love as well like like so many popular songs and I, I just felt that they I had enough of each and I felt that they should be in two separate categories so I made two individual CDs one called love one called laughter and pretty much all originals do you have a favorite song of yours that you have written uh, oh dear for different reasons I, I, I sort of have different favorites I'm, I must say I'm a I'm, I'm a big fan of the sort of the genre of double entendre songs so it sounds like you're singing about one thing and you're actually singing about something else and and one of my favorites in that line is it, 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 it's, it's almost unplayable because <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of naughty uh, but it's one called bird lover that's on the on the laughter album and, and I think that's getting towards being a triple entendre song. <sighs> uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a song that, I, that it, it just amused me so much to write it. And it, it really is 
quite, if you have a mind for that, it's quite sexually raunchy. And yet it just seems to be an innocent song about a cat. I had a lot of fun writing that one, but uh, I'm, I must say I'm a little bit careful where I sing that one. <laughs> I understand. One, one, one song that's very special for me that's on my love album, in fact it starts the album, is called Fair Catherine, which I wrote for my wife, who, uh, who just came in and brought me a cup of tea right now. That's a nice one as well. It, it's got sort of a British feel, it's, it's upbeat, and yet there's a lot of poetry in the words. I, I, I like it when, when a song comes to me and it seems to be something outside of myself. I can look at it as if, wow, that, that was neat. I don't know how that happened, but there it is. That, and, that, and that's one of those songs. When you go down the path of being an entertainer, a ukulele entertainer no less, you're choosing a different path in life one could say. So I'd like to ask you, what kind of adventures have happened to you as a result of this journey that you've been on in music? I have to say, Paul, you, you ask just the best questions. <laughs> there are, you know, you're sort of hitting on the things that are really kind of big issues in, in my life. Yeah, and this choice to be an entertainer, it, it was really a naive choice. You know, I, I believed all those movies, you know, where the, you know, a little band just gets together to rehearse and next thing somebody notices them and then they're thrust into the limelight and then they, they that's it, they're, they're famous forever then. I, I believed in that story for many years and I think part of me still does. I've, I've always loved the idea of entertaining. You know, I, it's something I would do. I would write songs, uh, I would write funny poems. And, and when I found a book in the library called The Independent Entertainer that was written by a clown, it made me realize that you could make a, a living as an entertainer. And I did. I became a clown first. That was my first thing. I would carry the ukulele around in a guitar case, with, which also contained the clown props. And then bit by bit, as I became more proficient at, at the music, uh, then I became more of a you know ukulele entertainer, king of the ukulele. But it's not an easy life. I th I thought it was going to be just fun and games all the way, you know. And um, and as time goes on, and as I, as I understand more and more about the business, I realise what a business it is, and and how much you have to do, and when people have succeeded, what you know what things they've had to do to you know to get to that point. Some some do fall into it. Some do have the have the lucky breaks you know but but many don't you know most are just out there hustling for gigs and uh, playing the gigs and working on it all and uh, there's a lot of hard work that you don't see and most people do not realize it all they see is a happy guy with a ukulele right and if you're going on stage with a ukulele no one wants to see a miserable guy so it doesn't doesn't matter what you've got going on the rest of your life you, you've always got to be the cheerful person but but quite honestly you know 95 percent of the of the work is going on behind the scenes and it, yeah it's kind of slogging away really you know just doing what has to be done you know I, I thought i could escape being a slave to a job and in a way i have done you know i i am i, I love being self-employed i love being able to do this for a living but it's still it's still it's still work it's still it's still a job even if it is more of a, a calling <laughs> at hmm. this point what is the best thing about being ralph shaw oh my goodness wow oh, dear paul what do you, oh no <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I, I am a bit of a, a manic depressive kind of a character. I, ha I have to say, you know, there are times where I, I'm just so full of joy and music and happiness and other times where I'm not. So so I, I would probably answer that question in different ways, depending on when you'd, when you'd catch me. I think professionally, I, I really love the way people that, that like what I do and get what I do and respond to it, you know, like, like you have, have have done you've expressed that I, I run a ukulele club in in vancouver here where i live and people come out to that we, we, we're playing along and i run the show and and i and I, I keep it fun we we have over we have over 140 people coming out to it now and just to see the delight in all their faces you know all these people who come with their ukuleles you know they've all got the problems in life but by the time that evening is over Everybody, every single person, they're just beaming. They've all got big smiles and they're all leaving and going off into the world. I, I just imagine each of them going into their, back to their homes, not with any, just full of, full of this good feeling. And, that, and they're individually going to be spreading that wherever they go. 
if, if I'd have to say that if there's one thing that really keeps me going in what I do, and it's the thing that I love most about what I do, it is spreading. You know, I'm, I'm this little nucleus of, of of positivity that 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 ripples out and, and and puts good into the world, and 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 helps others to to do the same thing for them for themselves and their world. For anyone who listens to this interview or who reads the transcript, what would you like to say to them? Don't give up your day job. (laughs) (laughs) Unless becoming a professional entertainer is something that you pretty much have to do, do it. Be be happy with whatever you're doing because everything we do, every every life is is worthwhile and every everybody um, discovering has their their problems and their, their trials in life so we really have to make the most of whatever we've got and, uh, and and work with that to the to the best of our abilities now for my last question who is ralph shaw hmm i don't know can you give me a bit more to go on <laughs> well somebody might see you and say oh from a distance ralph shaw is a singer and ukulele player and recording artist or an entertainer but sometimes we view ourselves differently or we think there's a part of us that not everybody gets to see Mm. so i guess i'm asking who is ralph shaw at heart do you know that's a very good question it's a really good question i don't know i I think i'm still i'm still on the journey to finding myself i i I really get what you're saying you know you know you're you're looking smart in your suit and you're you're fine mustache and everything <laughs> and here i am i'm in my cycling outfit i was just out out on my bike i i don't wear a bow tie you know whenever i perform i'm always in the suit and bow tie and that's what i present as, as ralph shaw the performer but when i'm not like that i'm not wearing a bow tie all the time you'll have to get back up to me on, on that paul un, until until i reach some moment of uh, enlightenment where everything all comes into some great oneness i'm, I'm still toying around with these aspects of myself that, that do different things and and play different parts and different roles. Well, that gives us an excuse to have another interview someday. <laughs> I, I would love that, Paul. This, is, this, is, this has been so neat to, to talk to you. Well, thank you very much for this interview. I can tell you on a very personal level, we've never spoken. We've emailed several times throughout the years, and I have an autographed photo of you where you drew a little palm tree in the corner of the photo. Your music has brought me some joy in my life, and I appreciate that. I must say, Paul, our correspondence has been uh, very, very encouraging for me as well. And, and, and yeah, it has been over a few years. I was, I was expecting you to look a lot, a lot older than you are. So <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on looking so young. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Keep playing the ukulele and keep singing and making this great music because it's what the world needs. Thank you so much, Paul. And you keep putting it out there. All the best, mate. All right. Have a good one. Yeah. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. I wasn't expecting such uh, an impressive moustache, by the way.